and welcome to worship at Lutheran Church of the Master. I'm Pastor Gail Munt, and I'm delighted to be here with you for the next foreseeable season, whatever that might be. I look forward to that. I want to say that I know some of you have had a good week, a great week even, and others of you have had a hard week and maybe are experiencing pain or, or hard times, grief. I want you to know wherever you are, I'm glad that you're here today. And I hope that the words of this service, the words of Jesus, speak to you and touch your hearts. Again, thank you for being here. Good morning. I'm uh, Don Rosenberry. I'll be your assisting uh, today. Now, before we start, I've got a couple of announcements. Today, again, I can't believe it's here again, is God's Work, Our Hands Sunday. Today is that Sunday. And uh, today, your hands get pretty light duty uh, because all you need to do is reach into your wallets and perhaps provide some funding to help Green Mountain Elementary students and their families pay for their... You know, I, I can't see my glasses fog up. I'm, I'm social distance. I think I'll be okay. Um, so anyway, what we were going to do this year for God's Work, Our Hands Sunday, which is today, is to help pay uh, for school fees for Green Mountain Elementary School uh, students and their families. This covers technical equipment, uh, other costs, especially if they have multiple children attending school. It's, uh, it can be relatively expensive, uh, but for only $35 or maybe up to $58, um, this can take care of these costs for these children. So um, if you're willing to participate by reaching into your wallet, uh, it's a fairly light, easy task this year for God's work, our hands. Uh, there's a basket on the table in the back, and if you want to drop off some cash or a check, or if you want to write a check, write it out to LCM in memo of uh, GMES fees. So this is a first for me, uh, acting as your assistant pastor, uh, assistant, uh, well, not pastor, but assistant. But I am also acting in my first official capacity as LCM's new president. And I'm very excited as my first duty to... Uh, do the litany of welcome to welcome our new pastor, Gail Munt. And that will be our first activity for today before we get started with the regular service. And one other reminder before we get started, and that is that we're keeping a close watch on COVID. Our COVID committee is on top of everything. Unfortunately, the Delta variant is rearing its ugly head, and here we are still wearing masks. And we're going to continue to do so until told otherwise. So sadly, um, we won't be able to hear your wonderful voices as we sing the songs, so, so please just hum that uh, from the other sides of your masks, and uh, we'll get through this together healthily. So our first item today is the opportunity to welcome Pastor Gail to LCM in the Litany of Welcome, and so we will proceed with that first before our uh, service commences. So... Pastor Gail, yes. a church family, and, and the rest of you too, is constantly changing. Loved ones come and go uh, at the beginning and the ends of their lives. Individuals come and go in our church life. It's important and right that we recognize these times of passage, these endings, and these beginnings. So today we welcome Pastor Gail Munt, whose time as our pastor for the interim period begins. So Pastor Gail... In the presence of this congregation, will you commit yourself to this new trust and responsibility and promise to discharge your duties in harmony with the constitutions of the church? If so, say, I will, and I ask God to help me. I will, and I ask God to help me. Will you love, serve, and pray for this people of God, nourishing them with the words of holy sacrament, and lead them forward during this important time of change? I will, and I ask God to help me. Will you lead this people of God in giving faithful witness to the word and in making known the love of God through loving service among themselves and in this community? I will, and I ask God to help me. Almighty God, who has given you the will to do these things, give you the power of the Holy Spirit so that you may perform them with strength and compassion. Amen. Congregation, 
I ask all of you now, will you receive this messenger of Christ, Pastor Gale, who continues the work in bringing the gospel of hope and salvation? Will you regard her as a fellow servant of Christ and work with her in the ministry and mission of this congregation? Will you pray for Pastor Gail and honor her for her work's sake and in all things strive to live together in the peace and unity of Christ? Amen. By your statements of commitment and the affirmation of this congregation, we welcome Pastor Gail as the interim pastor of Lutheran Church of the Master in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you. And now for our opening song. our confession and forgiveness, the Apostles' Creed. Uh, it, it's printed all in your bulletin. Some will be on the overhead, but if, it, if you don't see it, it is in your bulletin. So I invite you to follow along with me. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God who forgives all our sin, whose mercy endures forever. Amen. God of all mercy and consolation, come to the help of your people, turning us from our sin to live for you alone. Give us the power of your Holy Spirit that we may confess our sin and receive your forgiveness and grow into the fullness of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Gracious God, have mercy on us. We confess that we have turned from you and given ourselves into the power of sin. We are truly sorry and humbly repent. In your compassion, forgive us our sins, known and unknown. Things we have done and things we have failed to do. Turn us again to you and uphold us by your Spirit so that we may live and serve you in newness of life. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. God, who is rich in mercy, loved us even when we were dead in sin and made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. In the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. Almighty God, strengthen you with power through the Holy Spirit that Christ may live in your hearts through faith. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For the peace from above 
and for our salvation. Let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Now for the prayer of the day. Let us pray. O God, through suffering and rejection, you bring forth our salvation. And by the glory of the cross, you transform our lives. Grant that for the sake of the gospel, we may turn from the lure of evil, take up our cross, and follow your Son, Jesus Christ, and Savior and Lord. The Holy Gospel according to Mark, beginning at the 8th chapter, beginning at verse 27. Glory to you, O Lord. So this story provides the turning point in Mark's Gospel. Peter is the first human being in the narrative to acknowledge Jesus as the Messiah, the Chosen One. But he cannot accept that as the Messiah, Jesus will have to suffer. Moreover, Jesus issues a strong challenge to all by connecting discipleship and the cross. Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi, and on that way he asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? And they answered him, John the Baptist, and others, Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. He asked them, but who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, you are the Messiah. And he sternly ordered them not to tell anyone about him. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan. For you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. The Gospel of the Lord. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts Be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Who do you say that I am? If Jesus asked this of us today, how would we respond? Who do you say that Jesus is? Jesus' first question to the disciples was, what are other people saying about me? And that's a little easier to answer, isn't it? What are other people saying about you? And that sort of breaks the ice and it gives us a time to think about it before we then answer, what are we saying about Jesus? Who do we think he is? In her book, Almost Christian, a professor at Princeton Theological Seminary and an author, Kendra Creasy, helped conduct surveys for the National Study of Youth and Religion in the last decade. And this was a study of religious lives of American youth from adolescence into young adults. She interviewed over 3,300 teenagers from all spectrums of the Christian faith, a Protestant to Catholic, um, conservative to liberal, and a hint. 
She said this was the most depressing summer of her life. So this is what she learned. While three out of four American teens claim to be Christian, three out of four claim to be Christian, fewer than one half practice their faith. And of those one half who deem their faith important, most could not talk coherently about their faith or their beliefs. Many thought God simply wanted them to feel good and be nice. And when challenged, they could talk deeply about money, sex, family relationships with nuance. In fact, they were quite articulate. But they weren't able to converse or discuss their faith, scriptures, or what it meant for their life. Excuse me. She coined a term, imposter faith, and described it this way. Imposter faith is watered-down faith that portrays God as a divine therapist whose chief goal is to boost people's self-esteem. The problem with this, and the problem is that these youth didn't have the faith resources to handle the difficult questions of life, such as, why are my parents getting divorced? Why did my friend commit suicide? Why are there students who suffer from disease, poverty, bullying? The professor claimed that the parents in the church present the gospel of niceness to our children and youth. We want our children to be nice, and so we teach or imply by not teaching properly that faith is simply doing good and being good. I heard a children's sermon one time that kind of made me shudder, still does, that was talking about the sacrifice that Jesus gave for this world. And then to bring it home suggested that maybe the children should keep their rooms clean in order to pay back Jesus. Now, as a parent and grandparent, we want our children to keep their rooms clean. I get that. But not at the expense of watering, watering down the sacrifice that Jesus made for this world. Some youth directors were also interviewed and expressed their own frustration. They felt that they were bound by the church's goal and the parents' goal for the youth program, which was to ensure that their youth didn't have sex, didn't do drugs, were good, and frankly, didn't ruffle any feathers. The youth directors felt that the church called to take risk, to be bold, to be witness, and sacrifice was muted. Another professor at Princeton Theological Seminary, Professor Dean, said of youth and culture, if teenagers lack an articulate faith, it may be because the faith we show them is too spineless to merit much in the way of conversation. Ouch. Let me read that again. If teenagers lack an articulate faith, it may be because the faith we show them is too spineless to merit much in the way of conversation. Imposter faith. One reason that teenagers and others are leaving the church. The desire to help others has not diminished in teens and in young adults. In fact, it's stronger than ever. We're now familiar with the many studies and trends of millennials, Gen Y and Gen Z, that show they are volunteering in greater numbers and do want to make a difference in their neighborhood and in the world. So the question begs then, are we as Christ followers connecting the dots for those whom we have influence. You have influence in your family circles, in your community, in your neighborhood. Are we connecting the dots for those with whom we have influence? Letting them know we're, we as Christ followers, that's the reason we serve, the reason we advocate, the reason we forgive, the reason we are empathetic, the reason we do help others 
It's grounded in our faith. It's grounded in the scriptures and the sacrifice Jesus paid for humanity. So back to this study. For those teens who are committed Christians, they share four traits. They have a personal story about God that they can share. And that's probably true for most of us who continue to be involved in a church community. They have a deep connection to the faith community. They have a sense of purpose. They have a sense of hope about the future. So what's a parent to do? What's a grandparent to do? A neighbor to do? What is a church? What is we as a church are to do? What are we all to do? How do we overcome this gospel of niceness that teaches us simply all we need to do is be nice? And God rewards those who are nice. And the gospel lesson today, Jesus spoke with the disciples about what it meant to be a follower. And I'll give you a hint. Niceness is not in his description. You recall his words? If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. So I want to provide some context for this gospel lesson today as it adds power and insight to Jesus' words. We read that Jesus went with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And that is significant. For Caesarea Philippi was an ancient Roman city known for its pagan religions. Good Jewish folks did not go there. It was located at the southwestern base of Mount Hermon, about 20 miles, 25 miles south, um, no, let me start, 25 miles north of the Sea of Galilee. Mount Hermon was the tallest mountain of that area of 9,200 feet, and it's thought by some that that's where transfiguration took place on that mountain. Caesarea Philippi was the location of one of the largest springs feeding into the Jordan River. The abundant water supply made that area very fertile, and it was attractive for the religious worship. Numerous pagan temples were built at this city in the Hellenistic and Roman periods. And this area was most famous or infamous for the Grotto of Pan. Do you recall who Pan is? Any? All right, Pan is, was the half man, half goat, god of fright, thus the word panic, and is often depicted playing the flute. The spring at Caesarea Philippi emerged from a large, deep, dark cave, which became the center of pagan worship. Beginning in the third century BC, sacrifices were cast into the cave as an offering to God, little g. And there was debauchery around the cults and the religion. Then adjacent to this cave is a tall uh, natural wall. It's a rock wall that had niches carved out of it. The area is called sacred niches. And we know that statues of deities were placed in these niches by depictions on the coins from that city. One niche housed a uh, sculpture of Echo, the mountain nymph and Pan's consort. Excuse me. Another niche housed a statue of Pan's father. Inscription in these niches mentioned those who gave very large donations. Some things don't change, right? So it is in this setting, in the midst of all of these pagan religions of Caesarea Philippi, 
and the affluent debauchery that took place, that Jesus asked the disciples, who do others say that I am? Who do you say that I am? Peter professed in his statement of faith, you are the Messiah, meaning you are the chosen one, the anointed one. Also, this story is told in the Gospel of Matthew, too, and it's in the shadow of Caesarea Philippi that Jesus declared to Simon Peter after Peter made his statement of faith, and he told Peter, and I tell you that you, Peter, meaning rock, on, on this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. So, let me ask you first. If Jesus were to take us to uh, Caesarea Philippi today, where would that be? What would that look like? I'm going to let you each decide for yourselves on that where your Caesarea Philippi might be. I have thoughts of where mine would be, but I think each of us have to think about that. If Jesus were to take us to Caesarea Philippi today, where would that be, and where would he ask us those questions? And when Jesus asks us, who do people say that I am, how would we respond? And then to that personal question, who do you say that I am? Do we default to the responses given to that Princeton professor of saying, well, we're going to be nice and doing good and not ruffling feathers? Are we wearing the badge of an imposter faith? Or are we practicing our faith and able to speak about that faith boldly with courage with meaning, and with passion. Are we followers of Christ? Some of you might be asking, what does that even mean? Well, here's my challenge, my first challenge to you, is I want you to read the Gospels. Right now, we are studying the uh, Gospel of Mark in this season that we're in, is season B. I know it's a fancy term for it, season B, but we're studying the Gospel of Mark until Advent. It's only 16 chapters. I invite you to read Mark and make note, write down two or three things of what Jesus says or does that would translate to us to being a follower of Christ. See where God is asking you to follow. And then next, in following Christ and living as he did, we will meet people who need a loving word and a helping hand. Y'all, there are so many hurting people right now in our community and in our world. And maybe you are too. I've heard of so much sickness and pain and grief and honestly hopelessness recently. This past year and a half, well, it's not been easy. I refer to it as the pandemic pall, like the dusty, smoky skies we've been experiencing this summer in Colorado, and you have a good view of it from here when it's smoky out. And beyond, the pandemic has cast a pall over life. There are regular trials that we have as a part of life that are hard and painful and challenging, and then we add what we've experienced in this last season, and it's been a lot, hasn't it? It's been a lot. It's been too much for many people. As followers of Christ, can we make a difference for others? Are we different? Can we make a difference in each other's lives? Can we make a difference in this church and in this community and beyond? With the help of God, I know we can. I am sure we can. With this community, with you and me, working together, praying together, forgiving one another, offering grace to each other, following Christ together, God's ministry will continue to touch lives, especially when 
and where they need to be touched. And for that we can say, thanks be to God. Amen. Let us confess our faith to the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please join me for the prayers of intercession. Let us pray. Made children and heirs of God's promise, we pray for the church, the world, and all in need. Revealing God, you have made yourself known through bread and wine, water, and word. Continue to nurture your church, that it is a place where your presence is experienced and shared. Lord, in your mercy, creating God, you brought life into being and called it good. Bring new hope to lands devastated by tornadoes, hurricanes, floods, fires, and other disasters. Restore forests and curb overflowing waters. Lord, in your mercy, <clears throat> Protecting God, you desire all people to live in peace and safety. Provide for all who are in danger. Strengthen first responders to help meet to the complex needs of others. Provide care and compassion as they face trauma themselves. Lord, in your mercy. <clears throat> Forming God, you gather this community together. Shape our communal life, that in our prayers, praise, and worship, we honor you and encourage one another. Keep our disagreements civil and increase our joy in working together. Lord, in your mercy. Loving God, you dwell among all who experience hardship and the depths of distress. Twenty years on, there are still so many loose threads and upended lives on account of the terror attack of 9-11. Empower people of good, will everywhere to be weavers of our collective life and uplifters of the downtrodden. Relieve every heart that rages and mourns and will not be settled. Lord, in your mercy. Gracious Lord, we ask your healing hand on the friends and families listed on the prayer list today and any others that you are familiar with or concerned about in particular uh, silently in your hearts. Receive these prayers, O God, and those in our hearts known only to you through Jesus Christ our Lord. The peace of Christ be with you always. And I invite you to share peace by just nodding, doing peace signs, can just peace to all of you, uh, hand on a heart, waving, good. I see this is new, you haven't been doing this. Okay, peace, 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 peace. Good to see you all. So next we go into the communion liturgy. Does everybody have uh, some of the little communion with you? If you don't, raise your hand and someone will be glad to bring it to you. Because as you know, everyone is welcome to the Lord's table. This is not the table of Lutheran Church of the Master. This is not my table. 
This is the Lord's table, and all are welcome. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. You are indeed holy, almighty, and merciful God. You are most holy, and great is the majesty of your glory. You so loved the world that you gave your only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but have eternal life. We give you thanks for his coming into the world to fulfill for us your holy will and to accomplish all things for our salvation. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took the bread and gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup. He gave thanks. He gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people, for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in remembrance of me. For as often as we eat of this bread and drink from this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. To you, O God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be all honor and glory in your holy church, now and forever. Amen and an amen. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. The kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen the body of Christ given for you. There's no hurry. Get, when you get it open, go ahead and take it. The blood of Christ shed for you. Let us pray. Gracious God, in this meal, you have drawn us to your heart and nourished us with food and drink, the body and blood of Christ. Now send us forth to be your people in the world and to proclaim your truth this day and evermore. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. And hear these words of blessing. Go forth into the world in peace. Be of good courage. Hold fast that which is good. Render to no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the afflicted. Honor all people. Love and serve the Lord, abiding in the comfort of the Holy Spirit. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, rest upon you and remain with you this day and forevermore. Amen.
the service, uh, please join us in the uh, yard, the courtyard behind the building here uh, to celebrate the, the beginning of Pastor Gail's uh, time with us. So go in peace to love and serve the world. <laughs>